The Queen Mary II is often called the only ocean liner still in service. She launched in 2004, becoming the first true transatlantic express liner since the QE2 back in 1969. Think about that gap. At a colossal 345 metres long and 149,200 gross tonnes, the QM2 isn't just big, she is the longest, tallest, widest, largest and most expensive ocean liner ever built. Now when I talk about the QM2 as an ocean liner, I'm constantly asked the question, what is the real difference between an ocean liner and a cruise ship? And it's a totally fair question. There's so much confusion out there, with these terms often being used interchangeably, even though we have a vast global fleet of cruise ships. This question gets even trickier when you consider that both the QM2 and the QE2 before her were dual-purpose liners. They were designed to do both jobs, act as a traditional ocean liner and a cruise ship. So let's clear things up. First of all, almost all of the ships you've seen offering voyages today are cruise ships. They're built for pleasure trips, mostly in coastal waters. Think a Miami to Miami round trip exploring the Bahamas, or even a world cruise, where the ship often sticks close to the coast when it can. They're designed for leisure, port calls, and fun in the sun. Ocean liners, on the other hand, are passenger ships specifically designed to regularly make a line voyage. This means sailing directly between point A and point B, usually across a vast open ocean. They're about getting there. Perhaps the most famous of these routes is the transatlantic crossing, between North America and Europe. This route was pioneered by legendary liners from the Cunard Line, the White Star Line, United States Line, Norddeutsche Lloyd and Hamburg America Line. Imagine that history. This challenging stretch of water actually birthed the modern ocean liner. Innovations were driven by a need to effectively link Europe and America. But don't think it was just the Atlantic. Hundreds of line voyage routes existed during the ocean liner era, connecting countries worldwide. We're talking about famous routes like Union Castle's Britain to South Africa service, P&O's voyages to India, China and Australia, plus inter-Asia voyages, and the regular Trans-Pacific crossings, to name just a few. It was a global network. The title of the first purpose-built transatlantic liner is contested, but the SS Great Western of 1838 is a great place to start. She was a marvel designed by the legendary Isambard Kingdom Brunel. This ship was revolutionary the first built to cross the Atlantic using steam power for the majority of the journey. Sure, there were steamship crossings before, but those ships mostly relied on sails, only using steam in short bursts. Brunel's design for the Great Western was truly novel. She was large and efficient enough to offer superior buoyancy compared to earlier steamships. This, combined with engine advancements, allowed her to complete most of her voyage under steam power, setting her apart. Ironically, her triumphant entry was almost overshadowed when a rival, the smaller steamship Sirius, managed to complete the transatlantic crossing just ahead of the Great Western's maiden voyage. Yet, the Great Western, departing four days after Sirius, came within a single day of overtaking her rival. This feat powerfully proved that Brunel's purpose-built ocean liner was far more advanced, a true testament to visionary engineering. So after all that history, what exactly makes an ocean liner an ocean liner? Put simply, ocean liners are designed for a long duration, deep ocean voyage on a strict timetable. Just like modern air travel, passengers in the ocean liner era expected to depart and arrive on time, with no delays. Government mail and freight contracts were crucial for shipping lines, but these contracts came with strict deadlines. This meant that ocean liners had to be capable of sailing through all weather conditions, from dead calm to a terrifying Force 12 storm. If time was lost due to bad weather, it had to be made up. This demand led to the use of incredibly powerful engines. Early liners were paddle steamers, but by the 1880s, screw propellers became the norm. By the 1900s, turbines started to dominate over reciprocating engines. Today, modern ships like QM2 use diesel engines and gas turbines, so a lot has changed. So with that in mind, what are some of the key characteristics that can help you distinguish an ocean liner from a cruise ship? Well, here's one great way to learn more. This video is brought to you by me and my new book, The Evolution of the Passenger Ship. In The Evolution of the Passenger Ship, we've brought years of research together to create a book that takes you on a journey from the earliest sailing ships right the way through to the modern behemoths that we see today. The Evolution of the Passenger Ship is available at all good bookshops. And if you buy a copy, you help us by supporting the channel. Thanks so much, and now back to the video. The bow design. 
On ocean liners, the bow, that area from the very front tip of the hull to the superstructure, is noticeably larger and more robust than that on a cruise ship. Ocean liner bows are specifically designed to protect the superstructure from the enormous waves encountered in the open ocean. This isn't just a precaution. Many liners have faced truly monstrous waves during their service. The QE2, for example, was famously hit by a 90-foot rogue wave during a transatlantic crossing in 1995. That wave actually cleared the bridge and took the forward whistle mast clean off, but the long, powerful bow protected the majority of the ship's superstructure from severe damage. Some designs, like the French Line's Normandy and Cunard's Queen Mary II, take this even further by including a breakwater to help deflect waves away from the superstructure. Hull strength. Liners are simply stronger than cruise ships. Ocean liners are built as extremely robust vessels, with steel noticeably thicker than what you'd find on a cruise ship. This is crucial to ensure the ship is strong enough to withstand the heavy seas it will encounter in the open ocean year after year. A perfect example is the Queen Mary II, which has steel plates between 28mm and 30mm thick. This is significantly greater than the typical 20-23mm to 23 millimeter thickness found aboard a standard cruise ship. Bridge placement. You'll often notice a difference in the placement of the bridge on ocean liners compared to cruise ships. Nearly all ocean liners from the 1800s onwards have their navigational bridge on or very close to the topmost deck. Why is this? To ensure a good view over the long bow and crucially to protect the navigational equipment and the bridge officers from severe weather. You can clearly see this design on modern ocean liners like the QE2 and the Queen Mary 2. In contrast, cruise ships often have several decks of passenger accommodation or forward-facing lounges above their bridge deck. This can be a very easy way to tell the difference in the two designs. And as a fun fact side note, the name bridge actually originates from the early ocean liners. The bridge was quite literally a bridge that spanned between the ship's paddle wheels, where the navigational equipment was housed. High freeboard and boat deck. Ocean liners also feature a high freeboard and a high boat deck. Liners are consistently subjected to heavy seas, especially during rough winter crossings. Because of this, liners generally have a higher freeboard than cruise ships. Freeboard is the distance between the ship's exposed deck edge amidships and the waterline. You might also notice that the boat deck or promenade deck is usually positioned near the very top of the ocean liner superstructure. This helps protect the lifeboats from high seas. While this high boat placement is a common trait amongst ocean liner designs, there have been some noticeable exceptions. The Queen Mary II, for instance, has a high freeboard, yet her exposed deck and boat deck appear to be placed amidships. However, this makes more sense when you realise, due to the sheer size of the ship, her boat deck is approximately the same height above the waterline as QE2's was. Cruise ships, on the other hand, generally have a lower freeboard, and their boat deck is quite often situated lower within the hull. Speed. Ocean liners are also very fast. They're designed to undertake a scheduled, timely voyage, and as such, they generally require much more speed than a cruise ship. Cruise ships, by contrast, are usually designed to meander at a more leisurely pace from port to port. Since the 1970s, many liners were converted for cruising, yet they often remained faster than their modern cruise ship counterparts because of their original design characteristics. The fastest ocean liner of all time was the SS United States, which entered service in 1952. She still holds the record for the fastest westbound transatlantic crossing with an average speed of 34.51 knots. That's flying across the ocean. Today, the Queen Mary II is the fastest passenger ship in service by a comfortable margin. She can easily achieve over 30 knots if pushed. The QE2 was even faster with a maximum speed of 34 knots, but she regularly cruised at 32.5 knots during both cruise voyages and transatlantic crossings. This higher speed allowed QE2 to visit more ports and still maintain a tight cruising schedule. Speed isn't nearly as important for cruise ships. In fact, Cunard's current Queen Victoria and Queen Elizabeth both have speeds of around 23.7 knots, which is comparable to the Lucania and Campania, which were Cunard liners built all the way back in 1882. There are also some occasional cruise ship oddities with faster speeds than expected. P&O's 1995 built Oriana, for example, could hit 26.2 knots, allowing her to quickly transit the Bay of Biscay. And while NCL's Norwegian Spirit has a top speed of 24 knots, she has achieved well over this when cruising as Superstar Leo at the beginning of her career. Since the advent of the jet, the need for full-time ocean liners has naturally diminished. As a result, some lines created dual-purpose liners. These are ships designed to undertake both functions, this category includes ships like the Rotterdam, the Oceanic, the QE2, and of course, the Queen Mary II. 
These ships are in every respect an ocean liners, but they also have cruising elements incorporated into their design. This means that they can operate line voyages when the demand is high, but they can easily pivot to cruising, allowing them to remain profitable year-round, which is a crucial factor in the age of the jet. If you found this video interesting, please don't forget to give it a like. And if you're interested in this kind of content, please subscribe to the channel. It'd be great to have you on board. As always, a special thanks to our channel members who help make these videos possible. I'm Chris Frame. Thanks so much for joining me. And until next time, I hope to see you on board.